Great. We'll, uh, we'll get started now. Uh, welcome this morning to uh, this Q member webinar. I'm Penny. I'm the director of the Q initiative and I'm joined here with Hugh, who is the national director of improvement at NHS England and NHS Improvement. And we've also got uh, Will, who's the director of improvement from the Health Foundation. And just off screen, but very much here is Matt, who is the uh, insight and evaluation manager for Q and will, uh, along with me, be feeding in your comments and uh, thoughts as we go through the webinar. Um, it's a good job we're both here because we've got uh, quite a lot of you joining us today, we hope. We had over 200 people registered for today's webinar and we've got a kind of wide range of people from all across the UK um, reflecting the diversity of Q. Um, we've got a good mix of people who have uh, clinical and non-clinical primary roles. Um, as you can see, we have quite a few people here from uh, the acute care and provider sector, um, but a significant other category and people from all sorts of different backgrounds, which should help set us up for a really rich discussion. What's attracted so many people here today? Well, um, it's a really great opportunity to hear about um, a kind of upcoming framework which is being developed in the NHS in England. So you may have picked up that Hugh has been working on this for the last couple of months, but it will be moving into a new phase through until early summer. It's a really great opportunity for the Q community to be able to understand a little bit more about what's planned and to start to shape the content. We are going to have a kind of relatively simple format for the session, so I'll be handing over to Hugh in a moment to explain a little bit about the thinking about why such a framework is needed. Uh, we're going to get your thoughts on that. Um, we'll then be back to Hugh to hear more about what might be included in the content um, and how it's being developed. Uh, that we'll have some conversation between Hugh and Will, feeding in your questions as we go. And then it'll be back to you to get your reactions to what you heard um, before summarising a little bit about next steps. So, although this is a little bit more formal than the setup you might be used to within Q, we are hoping that it will nonetheless be really interactive. And um, <coughs> I know you won't kind of let us down in that. So we're going to have three polls spread throughout the next hour. And also, as we go along, you can add in questions and comments, respond to what you're hearing um, through the chat box. Um, again, a little bit different setup to what we normally do in Q. You won't be able to see other people's questions and comments, but um, straight after today, we will be doing a, a write-up to summarise all of the comments and the themes that came out from this session, which we will share sure. back to the community. Um, as I say, I'm sure we'll get a lot of questions and thoughts uh, through. We expect to be able to cover a proportion of those, but we know there'll be some things we won't get to, um, but we will make sure that that's fed on to the people who are going to be leading this process and, as I said, fed back to uh, you. So let's start off with the first poll. So uh, vote now. Um, you, this framework is going to be operating at all sorts of different levels in the system, so we thought it would be helpful to understand how many people <coughs> joining the webinar today are operating mainly at local, regional, national or perhaps international level. Um, I wonder, again, as it's the first poll, we'll give you a little bit of time just to get used to the technology and uh, start to get used to it. You should have seen some options coming up on your screen now. Looking at the number of people who've been registered, we're expecting that we will have Probably more people operating oh, at a local we have level. Results through. Oh, we do have results through. Okay. Um, well, so a pretty even split. How convenient of you to nicely illustrate the range of people operating within Q. So, um, uh, around a third who operate locally, um, regionally, and nationally. So, um, again, that should be really relevant to the context of the framework. I'm going to hand over to Hugh now to say a bit more about um, the background to this work. Okay, thank you, Penny. Um, as you've probably heard already, I, I'm sort of uh, coughing a bit in the background here. Uh, I've uh, probably the early onset of a chest cold. It's either that or I was at the Ulster Harlequins game on Saturday with Steve Pius, uh, who's our medical director and who's a big Harlequins fan. Fortunately, Ulster won by a point, so I have bragging rights at the minute. Uh, but it may be explain a little bit also why I'm a little hoarse, but uh, I apologise for that. 
Absolutely delighted uh, to be here this morning and I'm really looking forward to the webinar. I hope you get a lot from it. We're obviously taping it so that it can be of use to people as well who can view it after the event. And also importantly for me, it's not about why this session is about um, us explaining about the improvement framework. I'm really keen that uh, you feed into it, uh, both during this hour, because I want to get, we want to get some feedback from you, uh, but the, the framework I'm going to talk about is one that I want the system to co-produce. And I think right at the centre of that are the Q community. You are, if you like, um, probably the community that is most interested and most uh, supportive uh, and most committed to embedding an improvement approach across the NHS. And if I look at the reason, very much how I see this role, and I see the purpose of the Improvement Directorate, it is just that, to embed an improvement approach uh, and culture right across the NHS, so that more and more frontline staff are empowered and enabled to deliver safer and better services for their patients. And I think increasingly to do that in conjunction with their patients. So that's what I see as the purpose. It very much is my role and the purpose of the directorate. And I think the, for me, the improvement framework is going to be the vehicle which helps us deliver on that. I want, I want to say a little bit first about um, my journey. Why, did, uh, why am I so committed to improvement as, uh, as a vehicle for change? Uh, why have I taken on this role? Now, I was previously the chief executive of the Southeastern Trust in Northern Ireland, as you can probably tell from the, from the accent. And it was great to see that of, the, of the, uh, those attending, there's about 5% people from Northern Ireland. That's the great thing, I think, about the Q community is that it has people from right across the UK, from all our di uh, different bits of the NHS. Uh, and so I would like to, while our remit and the improvement framework is very much uh, from uh, NHS England or the, the NHS England in England's point of view, I think we know that Scotland are doing something similar and I would imagine the other devolved nations are also looking at how do they embed an improvement approach and culture. My background uh, as Chief Exec, the journey we went on, we put uh, improvement at the centre of how we, uh, how we did things, the centre of how our, our business strategy. Uh, when I was appointed to the job, I said that one of the things I wanted to do was create a new way of judging success. So what we did for every service was, in a sense, turn it on its head, move away a little bit from the, the top-down performance system, and very much focus on uh, three things. that We wanted every service to test itself against three parameters. The first being, assure it's safe. How do you test that your service that you're working in is safe and up to standard? What are the things that give you that, that satisfaction, that give you that assurance? Second thing was how do you improve the quality? How can you make what you do better? How can we make the service we work in better for our patients? And the third piece was how do we test the experience? What is the, the user's experience? Uh, but increasingly I think that became what's the culture? We were on this journey in the Southeastern Trust for about eight to ten years and towards the end of that uh, the results um, were very positive. If, if I distilled it down into a number of things, the, the organisation performed very well, but we hadn't sought out, set out to deliver on a very sort of performance controlled approach. We had been um, uh, focused on improving what we do, taking an improvement approach to drive uh, the improvement within the organisation, not a performance led. Uh, we also had the lowest uh, reference costs in Northern Ireland um, uh, in hospital and compared very favourably uh, with the rest of the UK. And we had a very high level of staff satisfaction and staff morale. Now, that's, that was my experience. Um, and when we look also, I think at one of the things which um, had, for me, is probably one of the, the biggest changes if I was to distill it down. Uh, when we asked in through the national staff surveys, um, staff around one, one of the questions was quality of care is my organisation's top priority. When we started our journey, um, just over one in two people thought that quality of care was the top priority. Now, if you think about it as a healthcare organisation, to only have one in two staff thinking that, that 
quality of care is the top priority. That's, that to me is, is almost scandalous that we, we had that level of people who didn't feel that as a healthcare organisation, as a health and social care organisation, that quality was our top priority. So we started our journey shortly after that. By two to three years, about 18 months in, two years in, uh, that had risen to about two-thirds of staff thought quality of care was the top priority. And at the last survey back in 2016, it's about to be resurveyed soon, that had risen to almost four out of five, 80%. And that was well above the national uh, average. And I think that for me, part of the benefit of embedding an improvement approach where we put safety and quality in the user's experience at the centre of how we judge success is it aligns the way the organisation thinks uh, and values what it values from top to bottom. Uh, that, was, that was, I believe, probably the biggest change was the cultural change. Now that's just, if you like, my experience um, and it's only one organisation. But if you go back to um, this, C this CQC report back in September 2018, it actually talked about, uh, looked across all the outstanding organisations, the organisations they'd rated as outstanding, and one common factor was that they had Im uh, improvement embedded at the front line. There was, it was how they did their business. It was, uh, it was an opportunity, it was uh, for staff, it was part of the culture, it was part of the way they did things. So this isn't my, my experience, which I've shared you, with you, from my own journey, but the CQC report is actually reinforcing that the outstanding organisations have quality improvement and improvement approach embedded into the way they do things. The, there was a report actually last week with South Warwickshire and Glenn Burley, the chief executive, talked about uh, although we are now officially outstanding, we are unaware that we, we are aware that we're not perfect. And he wanted to reassure his staff and his patients that they would continue to strive to get even better and use that to be a catalyst to be even better. So that was one of the common things CQC found was the strong organisations, the outstanding ones, they, achieving outstanding isn't the goal. Actually, when you get to that point of outstanding, you realise that it's a continual improvement approach and journey. And that's been reinforced by what CQC found, but also the, the organisations which are achieving outstanding. Is the improvement framework, um, and you think it has, it has had some key influences, uh, particularly developing people improving care, which was previously uh, developed about three years ago. Uh, there's work being done in Scotland, which I mentioned, by Health Improvement of Scotland and their quality management system. I believe the Q community is at the centre of this and as a community can be a real driver uh, for embedding improvement right across the NHS. And we've had a number of reports uh, from the Health Foundation which are talking about, and, and indeed other organisations which are uh, talking about how do we build this improvement journey. And I think that's one of the key things, one of the key messages is it is a journey. It's not, a single, it's not as simple as you buy something off the shelf. We can't take um, what Scotland have done, for instance, or from any other country, uh, and just bolt it in. You can't take what the South Eastern Trust and stick it into your trust and, and just apply it and everything will be fine. You actually have to walk your own improvement journey. So how do I see that this section was very much what is the purpose of, of the improvement for, uh, uh, framework, the why? And I see it very much as, if you like, almost like a sat-nav system. If we want to get to, like South Warwickshire, if we want to get to some of the, uh, the organisations that have truly embedded improvement, how do we get there? How do we get there as an organisation? How do we get there as a system? What do we need to do at a regional level? What do we need to do at a national level in order that we can shift to having improvement embedded right across the system? What I would like the um, improvement framework to do, in a sense, is to help people with that journey. Uh, one of the things my own experience and my own organization's experience was we very much went on our journey intuitively. We didn't employ, we didn't have IHI in, we didn't have Health Foundation, we didn't have King's Fund or anybody else in helping us with our journey. And I think if I look back, there were probably times where we could have, could have moved more quickly. 
we could have uh, we could have identified things that perhaps we needed to do. And one of the things I'm really keen is that for the improvement framework should not be something we use for judgment, not to say how well are people doing on improvement, but actually should be for organisations and systems and other bodies to say, well, here's where we are on our journey. Here's what we need to do next. Here are the next milestones. Here's the next bit of our journey and what should be a priority to take those steps. I, I've often used the analogy for the last four or five years. I've, uh, I go on the uh, Camino. I've spent a week each year on the Camino in Santiago, in northern Spain. And it's interesting, I, I think sometimes the quality improvement journey can feel a little bit like the, the Camino because whenever you first start out in your, your, your journey, uh, quality improvement journey, you can often find that it's, um, uh, and certainly our experience was, there weren't many other organisations that we could relate to. And the first part of that journey can feel um, almost a sort of um, uh, isolated or, or sort of lonely journey. What we want is to create, and I think one of the things the Q community does, is create a, a community on that journey. And the further you walk on the journey, the more connections you make, the more uh, networks you build, the more that other people are there to support you and help you on, the, on your journey. What I would hope with the improvement framework is also that we build a framework around which will help people uh, with the next stage of their journey and help them build that network and help them build that community so that they can make their journey maybe more rapidly than some of the first uh, organisations to do it have done. Uh, also for me, I, a couple of things here which I just want to pick out because I think the key bit about the journey is it's not actually about getting to a destination. It's actually about making our services. It was the thing that Glenn said, which was even though we've reached outstanding, that's not the destination. It's actually about how do we get better tomorrow than we are today? How do we get better next month than we are this month? And actually, we don't ever arrive. It's a bit like, that's why the picture of the rainbow there, it's a bit like outstanding. When you get to outstanding, you realize actually that wasn't the destination. The destination was is, is, is about creating a culture and an approach where you continually improve. And that for us uh, in improvement, and I think for the Q community, uh, is the end of the rainbow. And what I hope is the improvement framework will become a tool for help to help people on their journey uh, as they embed improvement approach and culture into their organisations and systems. Penny, I'm going right. to hand back to you for some... <laughs> questions and I even managed to stay roughly to time that which people impressive. who know me is pretty impressive. <laughs> so I, I should tell you we have somebody with some very large signs just behind <coughs> us here making sure that if, uh, if he gets carried away we will keep him in check. <laughs> Not necessarily so far. Okay so um, we're on to our second poll now. We're starting to see some kind of questions and comments coming through. Please do just, just keep, them, keep them coming. Um, but given this framework is essentially about trying to encourage a more improvement framework, uh, improvement approach, um, we thought we'd kind of step back, just ask, well, what do you think is most important when encouraging people to take an improvement focused approach? Uh, we've got six options there based on the Health Foundation's work, things that uh, as a community you've raised with us previously. If there's something that you think is important that isn't covered there, please just do put it in the chat box and we'll feed that through separately. Um, I expect it might take you a little bit longer to make your choice. So, uh, Will, in the meantime, what do you think? <coughs> well, I, my, my eyes are drawn immediately to number five, which kind of resonates with Hugh's opening statement on the importance of having an aligned and enabling culture. Because without having that kind of culture, then, for example, even if you know what good practice looks like or you have all the skills, then actually <coughs> making that change happen is going to be really difficult. But actually, they're very interdependent, aren't they? Because it's actually by, for example, making it easier to learn from others uh, who are doing improvement and having that right balance that you start creating that culture, I think, that mm -hmm. enables that kind of change to take place over time. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so a, a, tricky, a tricky question we set you there. So uh, <laughs> let's see the results up on the screen now. Um, and I should apologise in advance. I'm afraid the studio here has not necessarily had the same passion for... Uh, effective measurement for <laughs> and uh, way of displaying data. So we do have, unfortunately, pie charts throughout. Um, but um, in terms of the things that are coming up most strongly, making it easier to learn from 
uh, each other about how to achieve change and creating an aligned an and enabling culture um, coming out particularly strongly, but actually all of them um, standing out as prominent to you. Um, OK, so um, I think we'll move on now in order to hear a little bit more about actually what you're going to be doing in terms of developing the content of the framework. Yeah. It's interesting, Penny, actually, just to, to, to flip back one, because mm -hmm. I, I think there's something, there's probably a seventh, which is all of the above to varying <laughs> degrees, you know, and it's because uh, I think all of those things are important. Mm -hmm. and But maybe for me, I think th the tools are really important and building up that capability. But I think one of the, uh, we've had this experience, I suppose, recently with the VM and the Vital Signs organisations where um, we've had the same tool um, with the same people over the same time frame and the same approach. And we've had um, sort of different levels of results. And for me, I think one of the things is how do we create, really important is, how do we create the right environment for the tools to work? And I think that's, that will connect a little bit with what I'm going to say in terms of um, the, the framework and the, the, the sort of design of it. Um, what I uh, think with the framework is, uh, and I'm really keen, I want to say at the outset, this, what I'm going to present to you is very much the skeleton or the outline of the framework. And I, I would be very interested to hear views back on that. But more importantly, I see this as the skeleton. Uh, what we will want to do and, and aim to do over the coming months is actually to get the system to help us co-produce and take the lead in producing what does good look like. So for every facet of the um, framework, what we want to be able to do is, is say, here is the key components of it, but here actually in each one of these components is what really good looks like, but also at a number of levels. So let, let me just explain that a little bit. So the, the core of this will be, uh, and this will be familiar, I suppose the overarching piece is, is the sort of vision, the purpose which I've already talked about, uh, the NHS long-term plan, that's setting out which has also referenced the importance of embedding improvement uh, into the, the NHS in terms of how we do things. If you look at this, um, the core of this, it would be very familiar to many people because it's the, in essence, it's the Duran trilogy where you have the quality planning piece, where we have our learning systems, our priorities, our scale and spread. The piece, the quality control piece, which we've, I think, been heavily weighted towards, that we're, we're assuring, we're inspecting, we're ensuring the system uh, is uh, up to standard, we have heavy control, this is how to do things, and it's very much, if you like, internally focused. And we, that quality control piece has been very, uh, very well developed. The bit that I think we need to develop more um, is the quality improvement piece. What is, how do we get, when we identify that we're at a certain point and we want to get to another point, what are the tools that we use? How do we build, what's the strategy? How do we build the skills and the tools um, that we need? But I think importantly, and the, the reference I made uh, a few minutes ago to um, the tools being important, but the tools won't work unless they're in the right environment and the right conditions for the tools to be successful and for people to be successful in using them. And for me, that's where, if you like, the platform for the whole thing to be built on is these, what I would term, enablers. Uh, and so some of these will overlap with other areas. But we know that uh, for a quality improvement approach to be successful, that there is leadership and support at the top of the organization, but also at every level within the organization. We need the board level support, but we also need uh, leaders of the front line to buy into this. So there's the, the having that um, uh, vision, if you like, having the strategy, having that leadership commitment is really important. The second enabler uh, I would see is around the people and having people who are engaged, people who are empowered, people who um, have, a, have a joy in terms of doing this work and are committed to doing this work and feel that they can. The third enabler is very much around and I think is one of the really important pieces. How do we build a culture where people, and, it, and it's, it's back to that purpose piece, we need an embedded improvement culture where people feel safe to try things 
where people feel they, they, they're encouraged and empowered and working in an environment where they're uh, respected and supported to actually try things and try to, to, to make improvements to their service. Also, I think from a cultural point of view, building a much more collaborative um, uh, approach so that we're working not just within our silos, not just within our organisations, but thinking and working much more across systems. So we're trying to build a collaborative culture, continual improvement culture, a learning culture, and somewhere which feels safe for people to try improvement. <coughs> Excuse me. And the final piece, um, which I think is really important, is the co-production piece. Um, how do we actually get patients, um, families, carers, and even communities involved in terms of the types of improvement that we're trying to change. We know that uh, moving to the next level will be determined by doing this in partnership. And so creating that sort of uh, co-production as, as an enabler for this framework. So if you like, those are the seven key components of the framework. Um, but I, I, I would be interested uh, in getting some feedback if people feel there's things that we're missing, if there's uh, other things that perhaps aren't in that framework. But the key component and one of the things which I'm, I'm really strong that we're not going to do, we're not going to sit in a, a, a darkened room at the centre uh, and tell you what good looks like across each of those components. We want the system, people who've been working in the system, people who are committed and understand improvement, to help us say, well, actually, there's, there's the really high standard, there's the gold standard that we want to get to. But we also want that to be at a number of levels. Because this is, shouldn't be a single framework. If you like, it's almost three-dimensional. Um, it should be for where we've done a lot of our work traditionally, which is at the provider level, the organization level. So we will have, uh, to take this forward, we're going to have three work streams. Uh, and we want to do, if you're a, a healthcare or social care, health and social care provider, what does a really good look like across these seven components? But we also want to do that at the system level. We've said about being collaborative, we've said in the NHS long-term plan that actually moving to, the, to deliver some of the, the key objectives we have to do much more in a system way with our partners in a collaborative way with other partners so that we actually get upstream and improve health status as well. If we're going to do that, we have to understand what does really good look like at a system level for this framework. And then the third level is the national and regional level. What does, what's expected of regional bodies? Uh, what's expected of us nationally to support this approach and embedding an improvement approach and culture right across the NHS. So to do this, um, this, this is the sort of, um, if you like, slightly dry governance piece. We'll have an oversight board, not to, to determine the content, but to oversee the process, because I would restress that we want this to be uh, co-produced by the system. And to do that, we've identified three work streams. So the provider work stream, which will look at what's happening out there, will engage with people, will get people's views, as I say, in a co-produced, um, in a co-production way, uh, to tell us, well, this is what really good looks like. That's the sort of gold standard we want to get to. But also identifying maybe some of the milestones along the way. So when we talk about, um, for instance, QI capability, what are the really top organizations got? And what, are, what were their milestones along the journey? So as people can then say, well, we're at this stage. This is what we need to do next. This is, this is how we could move on the next step along our journey. So that's for the providers. We also want to replicate that for um, the systems. Uh, and whilst there are some really good pockets of work being done at system level, we really need people across um, primary care, across social care, across uh, other partners to feed into what would uh, really good look like? How would, uh, in terms of improvement approach and culture within a system? And then finally, the last piece is at the national regional level, what do we need in place in order to support this approach right across the NHS in England? 
So th this is a, a much more complex diagram in terms of uh, what I've been just saying. And I suppose there are three phases to this. The first phase, which we're, we, we're going to start, uh, we're using probably December very much as a, a setting the foundations, setting the infrastructure in place to do this. And then we would spend the period, really the next three months after that, through January, February, March, having what this would term as the scan uh, uh, phase, where we'll be very much out with different bits of the system, uh, hearing what people's views are, giving people the opportunity to feed into that uh, and tell us what they think, both in terms of the skeleton, but also particularly what would content look like. Um, so that would be the first phase. We also then have what we would term the focus, where we start to bring that uh, together into um, a bit more detail in terms of what would good look like at each level. What would people have to do? Uh, what would success look like? And, and I, one of the things I should have stressed is, as you will know, there is already work being done on, for instance, the people plan. Um, we don't see that um, we're doing a new thing um, that's separate from the work that's been done on the people plan. We'll be feeding into the people plan so that when we talk about the things we want in terms of leadership and the leadership compact, a continual improvement culture should be a central part of that. So we would see that we would have one improvement uh, or one leadership um, uh, compact and one leadership dimension that overlaps. And this is where we're not putting up boundaries between the work of the people plan and the improvement framework. We would see that it would be a bit like a Venn diagram where they actually overlap. The leadership compact uh, would include the things that are necessary uh, and core for the people plan and for the improvement framework. So we will have one leadership piece. Similarly, there will be issues where there will be overlap with the people piece uh, and indeed with some of the other um, key strategies. So it's not, we'll not be doing things in silos. That's, uh, you know, we're all going to have to do things much more in terms of systems and collaborative approach. That's the way we see things moving forward. The final stage, and, and this will also be part of the discussion, is the sort of how do we um, test that, prototype it, and also make it available for people right across the system. As I said earlier, I don't want this to be something that we use um, suddenly that organisations or systems are used, that this is used to judge how well people have done uh, and where they are. Because in, in some senses, I think that that almost puts people under pressure to say, well, we're, we're at this stage on the pathway or at this stage on the journey. Whereas I would like the framework to be something that people, organizations or systems can use to self-assess or even to build with the communities to build the opportunity to peer assess so that people are helping each other and building communities to help them along the journey. So I'd like to see it so that it's much more uh, that we use it as a, uh, a development tool, as a, as a, if you like, that sat-nav system for people to be able to chart their journey in whatever part of the NHS they work in. So um, we're going to talk uh, a little bit also um, further on around the opportunities to engage, um, but we hope to have a number of sort of face-to-face uh, -face type engagements and public uh, events and staff events. Uh, we'll also be doing quite a bit in terms of virtual engagement. Um, we'll be doing more sort of Twitter chats and uh, opportunities for people to engage online. As I say, we'll be doing lots of workshops. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. But also I think the opportunity on a, uh, for the Q community to play a really central role in this. And uh, we want the framework my view is I would really love to see that this framework becomes something that the community, the Q community, and organisations and different bits of right across the system in the NHS use to help them to embed improvement into their, their part of the NHS. And it should be a tool, it should be a, uh, a framework which helps people with that. It's not something that we want to impose from the centre. We want it to, to help people to, to make take the next step in their journey. Penny.
Brilliant. Uh, thanks, Hugh. Well, you've heard that as an invitation. Let's um, start off that involvement from the key community by making sure we get plenty of your comments through. We've got uh, um, you know, some really interesting comments and suggestions coming through. Um, while Matt and I try and synthesise those, um, Will, would you like to kind of uh, kick off? I mean, we're, we're looking for conversations and comments in kind of any of these areas, um, so hoping that key members will feed things through on that. But in the meantime, um, Perhaps, Will, you could start the conversation sure. going. So, um, Hugh, I think um, uh, the concept of the framework overall, people recognise the quality management mm. system approach. Um, um, within that, given that we're talking with the Q community, I wondered if you'd expand a little on the role, um, you talk about the role of the learning system in quality <coughs> planning um, and uh, how we can get better at learning from what's going on across what is a vast system um, mm. in NHS. What do you see as the role of Q and of communities more widely in, in helping to yeah. achieve that? I, I suppose it, it, the more we can do these things together, uh, I think the more successful we'll be. It's that, that sort of, you know, that very famous sort of African proverb where, you know, if you want to go uh, fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together, uh, which a number of, of people have, have quoted and used. But, I think there's really something in that, and it was you know using the Camino as a sort of analogy. Uh, when people are on that sort of 700 odd kilometer journey, one of the things that keeps them going is that they're on the journey with others. And I think one of the the and those those organisations and those people, I suppose, that have been at the leading edge of of uh, quality improvement, have found at times that it can be quite a an isolated position, it can be quite a lonely position as you try to get your bit of the system or you try to get your organisation to really buy into that. And in fact we've had lots of examples in the past where we've had really good people uh, who are really enthusiastic but actually the, their environment where they were didn't buy into it. And I think that having and working as part of a community where people stay connected, where they help each other, uh, where they, uh, you know, the idea that we, we all have to find the solutions to, to some part of this on our own is a nonsense. The more we can actually work together, uh, and I have some very good examples even from my own experience where, um, you know, we, we were um, uh, struggling with, with something we, we'd find in uh, my previous organisation that we'd actually a bit of a split between professionally trained staff who were doing our nine month programme and it was they, they were really enthused uh, by getting involved with uh, quality improvement but actually some of our non, non professionally trained staff didn't feel a part of it. Mm. But it was actually um, when we engaged um, and built a relationship with East London uh, where we actually got the idea of, of running a slightly different program and they got some ideas from us. And so that doing things together actually meant we, we find solutions to things and, and we move forward more quickly. And I think that's where if we build these communities, learning networks, learning communities, that actually everybody's journey will, come a, will become a little bit easier. And we'll help each other and we'll, um, we'll, we'll find that journey will move a bit quicker and we'll definitely go farther. Very good. Penny, Matt, are we ready for a few questions from the uh, community? <laughs> yes, um, thank you. Please do keep them coming. We'll do our best to feed in as many as we can. Um, we've got uh, quite a lot of support for the idea of moving away from assurance, but um, a few people asking about how we're going to build the kind of capability and shift the culture at national level in order to really do that. Mm. And um, just a little bit of probing about how you're going to avoid CQC or other organisations using this framework once it exists in ways that you're hoping mm. to avoid. So maybe I've got a couple more, but let's start with that one. Yeah, I, I think the first thing to say is not, and, and if, you, if you go back to the quality management system, the Duran piece, it's not one bit of the system that trilogy is good and the other bit is bad. And I think there's, um, I, I think it's about the balance for me. And I think we've been heavily weighted towards that control. And, and you know, my, my own initial experience in, in terms of being here for the first eight months is seeing some organisations which have, have been uh, organisations which have been struggling. And 
they are what their experience is is we have a lot of people going in to inspect them to review them I visited an organization which uh, was in special measures and in the six weeks prior to my visit had had 16 different visits and uh, reviews and inspections and each one of those is different and that's the quality control piece but actually the organization wasn't getting any great help in terms of well how does it improve how does it get from that point to where it needs to so I don't think it's any aspect it's not that the quality control piece is bad and we now need to just give that up and do quality improvement it is actually about a balance that we need a balanced quality management system and I think that that um, building that capability across the system and where I think the framework can help is it can identify at each level what we need to do so that the really top organizations have a very clear improvement capability building strategy. They know what they're trying to build. They, in some places, they even have dosing formulas um, that they have, um, and they understand the different levels uh, and what they're trying to do in terms of building that capability. What we have to do is get the framework to illustrate to people the different steps, the different components of, if you like that, those really good organisations. And where are they and how do they take the next steps to get to that point? And that's not something I think we've really made clear enough for people. So it's that's where I think the framework can help people to actually say, well, we're here and that's where we need to get to. Okay. Um, and Will, you're going to be playing a role in uh, helping to develop the framework at kind of national, regional level. What, what do you think is most likely to be helpful through this process in terms of shifting the way that national regional organisations work? Well, I think a um, very interesting thing behind your question, Penny, and if I understood it from the community, is um, that we know that sometimes if you introduce a framework or a tool into an environment that's not got an improvement-focused culture, that it can be used in ways that are unintended. Um, so, for example, good evidence, you look at the patient safety thermometer initiative and the evaluation of that work, where something that was entirely intended to be used for improvement, the evaluation show staff experienced it as a tool for accountability and for blame. Um, so the shift that we've got to make is thinking, as Hugh's talking about, in this far more holistically in terms of quality planning, improvement and assurance and then really co-designing and working with people to say, well, how is this framework going to be helpful to you? How can it be introduced in a way that supports this goal of developing towards improvement? So co-producing this with the partners and stakeholders that are Hughes set out feels really important so that this framework lands in a way that, as it's intended, is supportive and enabling, um, given that the whole system is on a journey, it feels to me, of its own, from one which has, as you said, probably had a balance more towards regulation and accountability, towards one that's now trying to get that very much balanced um, perspective. So I think sensitive uh, handling, good conversations and co-production are probably the best way through that. Mm -hmm. uh, Penny, if I, I come back here, you asked also about the national level and uh, undoubtedly, and we, we've had this conversation at the national level, is we also need to change too. Mm. Because uh, and this is where the framework can help. What does it mean to be uh, to take an, an embed an improvement approach and culture into the way we do things? And what does that mean for how we do things at a national level? Mm -hmm. And I think and, and and you know part of that is the leadership compact in terms of how we do our business and how we we drive uh, and support change in the system. And so that, that will be that will be one of the things we need to draw out um, in the co-production of this. But there's no question that nationally um, we have to shift and get the balance right as well. Thank you. Useful to hear that. Um, I've got a few <coughs> different comments that are coming through here. I won't attribute the questions um, and we won't attribute any particular questions in the write-up afterwards or comments that you make unless we check explicitly with you. So. Um, although that will be visible to us, um, please do feed things through even if you don't want it uh, identified as coming from you. Um, I've got a couple of questions here which are about how this will link up with other initiatives that are underway. So people are specifically asking about how it will link to work around the National Patient Safety Framework, how it might link to um, the work of NHS Digital, NHS X. Um, and then we've also had a question about um, 
this being an NHS-focused framework, but in the context of integrated mm. care, how we should think about uh, the role it can play and the connections it needs to make. Mm. Two or three questions in there. Um, <laughs> Let, let me start with the, the last one, the, um, the social care one, and I've, I've sort of been tracking a few of the comments there as well. And I think um, one of the things um, from my previous experience uh, where the trust I was in was an integrated health and social care organisation. So we delivered uh, everything from children's homes, home-based care, uh, care for elderly, mental health, disability, across sort of... Um, uh, different facilities and in people's homes. Uh, the interesting thing is the approach, uh, the, the continual improvement, quality improvement approach was embraced by social care. And if you think about it at its most basic, quality improvement and continual improvement is something that should be able to be applied anywhere. I mean, it's, it's about, uh, and we did in the organisation, we had it in finance, we had it in uh, HR, we had it in administrative functions, we had it in estates, uh, and we certainly had it in social care. So that how do you know that what you're doing is safe and up to standard? How do you want to make it better? And what's the user's experience and culture? Those three questions can be asked anywhere. Mm -hmm. And the answers should be also uh, from anywhere. But I think one of the, the things we've lost is that our professions, health and social care staff, the people that work, you know, the 1.3 million people that work in the NHS in, in England, but the, the, you know, the even greater number that work across health and social care in these islands, the vast majority of those people are motivated and interested in pushing the boundaries forward to make their service safer and better. What we've got to do is give them the tools, but more importantly, create the environment where they can do that. Mm -hmm. And actually, I think by having been too heavily focused on some other things, we've actually disempowered people from being able to do that. Mm -hmm. And so, yes, I think it isn't as well developed in England in, at the system level, but this is our opportunity to say, well, actually, here is where we want to get to and here's the milestones along the way. And we want people in the system to help us chart that journey. And so obviously it's people in the system, but also taking a person-centered view of this helps us keep that holistic view in mind. We've had quite a few comments coming through around um, patient and public involvement, both in terms mm -hmm. of the development of the framework and making sure that whatever is produced will be meaningful to mm -hmm. patients and the public. Is that part of the intention? It is. I mean, you, you saw that one of the key components of it, I think, is, is the co-production piece. And in a way, we're, we're living that with this process where we're trying to co-produce the framework. But actually, um, I think as we move forward in our health and social care services, having users of our service, people who actually have lived experience of living with an illness, living with a vulnerability, living with a condition, and availing of our services, combining and marrying them with the, the professionals, the people that have learned experience, will give us a new dimension to how we take healthcare forward in the future. Uh, I spoke at an event uh, last week, NHS Select, and I'm speaking at, at one uh, indeed this afternoon, where again I'll talk about the power of uh, being able to harness uh, people's lived experience uh, with that learned experience will enable us to, to deliver benefits that we can't under our, our existing model where we don't have that. And IHI talk about that sort of um, almost the, the third level, moving to the third curve. Uh, and part of that is actually about what they term seeding power. And I'm not sure I particularly like that term because, but what it, it's referring to is whenever we engage people about their condition or the service that they use. We're giving them some ownership back about what happens to, and almost ownership and responsibility back for the care that they have, and indeed for their condition and their state of health. And, and we should be doing that in partnership. Mm -hmm. um, we, we're getting an awful lot of actually um, very positive comments about this, the idea of the framework. We're getting some great suggestions of 
examples of where quality management systems are being used and some um, really nice ideas starting to be fed through around um, buddying, around other ways in which this could be uh, used in practice. Um, but I don't feel I'd be doing my job unless I picked out one of the more critical questions. Oh, <laughs> and this good. is probably the last one we have a chance for. <coughs> um, uh, there's a question here about how you will actually um, be embedding some of the principles that you're talking about here in, within the work of NHS England and NHS Improvement. Mm -hmm. I, I, as I said earlier, I think um, the, the, there is a need for change right across the system, uh, and that includes at national level. That is why one of the um, work streams is, what does this mean at a regional level and at a national level in terms of how we do our business? Because if we're saying, um, my, and I, I've had the conversation with the board, uh, I've had the conversation at the exec level and there is a commitment to move to much more of an improvement based approach. The long term plan says that and I think there is a recognition that uh, we have been very much in the performance assurance control end of the trilogy uh, and um, we, we have gone through a period over the last 10 years where there's the, the building up of the performance approach. I think there's a recognition and you know, this is the CQC piece, we look at the outstanding organisations. People have, they, it's not that they give those things up, we don't let go of, of operational, good operational management, we still have that. But it's actually about how do we harness the, the eyes and the minds of the 1.3 million people that work in the NHS to drive it forward. The idea that we can say from the centre, do it this way, here's the solution, here's the right answer. Uh, uh, as the way we improve the NHS is a nonsense. We have to actually, yes, we set the strategy, we shape the approach, but actually with something about harnessing those 1.3 million people's minds, ideas uh, and eyes so that they can see how to make it safer and better. Mm, thank you. Um, and in that spirit, let's move on to the final poll before we just wrap up and say a little bit more about uh, next steps. Um, so say this is something that will be developed kind of nationally with people from all across the system, but should be something that's actually helpful to people if we get this right um, in, in their work. So our third question is, uh, just based on what you've heard today, in what way do you think the development of such a framework could be useful to you in your work? Say we've um, put down five comments, uh, suggestions there, but if there's something <coughs> else that is missing, please do put that into the um, comment box. Um, I don't know if you'd like to reflect for a moment on any of that while people are... Um, and I think, Penny, the other, the other thing I'd maybe add to this, mm -hmm. which maybe you can put it, people can put into their comments, is any thoughts or ideas they have in terms of how they want to engage and yes. uh, how we can actually get that uh, reach out and how we get um, the ideas and people's thoughts back because we, we touched on the sort of traditional um, sort of workshop approach. We will be doing that type of engagement. We'll be doing the sort of Twitter chat online. Um, we'll be trying to give people sort of online and other opportunities to feed in. Um, but I'd be really interested if people have other thoughts um, in terms of how, how we might get more views, particularly in some of the areas which are maybe, uh, we've talked about the system, um, uh, being maybe slightly further back or not having as many organ um, parts of the system that are necessarily developed. How do, we, how do we get those ideas, how do we get the different mm -hmm. players in the system to feed in? And I'd be really interested to hear those views as well. Great, yes, so please do keep um, comments <coughs> in there. Um, so we have the results now. Um, so they should be up on your screen. <coughs> reasonably clear. So we have one that hasn't uh, registered at all. We have the most significant um, factor that you think this could be helpful with is in encouraging organisations and systems to be more joined up and aligned. Um, and providing a structure for, or uh, sorry, promoting useful discussions about how best to achieve improvement also coming across strongly yeah. there. Yeah, and, and I think that last piece um, I think is very relevant because I, I think one of the risks is CQC have said uh, putting improvement at the centre of how we do things is and having it embedded in organisations is what gets organisations to outstanding. And I think there is a risk, um, therefore, that people sort of um, 
adopt QI, um, but don't necessarily embrace it. I, I, my old um, boss and mentor, a wonderful man called William McKee, had a lovely expression which was um, plucking feathers from passing geese. And what he meant by that is there can be a sort of in fad. And I think we have to be really careful that improvement, quality improvement isn't a sort of, because CQFC have, CQC have said it's good, that actually suddenly everybody adopts it. We want this to embed, we want this to be, we want frontline staff, it to be their experience of the culture that they work in, and that they can contribute to making their services safer and better. So that piece around making sure it goes beyond having a strategy yeah. to how we actually do things yes. and what people experience is really important. Great. Will, any final reflections on what this is telling us? Yeah, I think it's interesting that, that encouraging organisations and systems to be more joined up and aligned came through. We didn't have time to get to it, but I think a number of comments coming through asking how will this fit with what organisations are already doing. So really important that where things are going well, this framework supports and accelerates that. Um, how to dock with, for example, all of the energy around digital and NHSX and technologies. And again, um, you know, improvement has a lot to say to that world. And so ensuring that the initiatives that are coming through that stream feel that this work is going to be supporting getting better uptake of technology and improvement, for example, with the innovation world. So I think a, a framework like this can be incredibly helpful, but kind of like when we thought about first designing Q, we need to think about how we're going to make sure that it docks into what already exists and supports, enhances where that's right and aligns really well with what else is going on in what is a very wide and complex system. And Penny, maybe there's there's a, a, a question which the, I think one of the things the Q community has done really well is it's connected at individuals um, mm. a, and helped to create that sense of community at an individual or at a, a, a person or a professional level. Uh, how could we replicate that organisationally? How do we create mm. networks, learning networks or learning communities across organizations and across the system rather than just at individuals and I'd be really interested to hear the community's views and thoughts on that. Mm, and indeed whether key members see themselves as the human connectors between organizations mm -hmm. um, uh, as, as well as other things. Okay so um, we're nearly at time now. Um, in terms of next steps you said a little bit earlier about um, <coughs> some of the ways that people could get involved in this uh, going yeah. forward. Anything you'd like to add? We've, we, uh, I've talked about a lot of the, we've got the workshops, uh, we'll have workshops coming up, we'll have virtual, we'll have uh, Twitter chats, we have all sorts of things. So um, more details on that will follow, we'll post that. Um, and we're, we're sort of using December to set the foundations and people can anticipate that we'll have out through the Q community and through a variety of other sources then sort of details about uh, a whole range of engagement opportunities. But if people have other ideas, please do send them in. Great, thank you. It's great to hear there's be lots of opportunities to feed into this because it feels like we've only just kind of touched uh, the tip of the iceberg with this. Um, if any thoughts occur to you over the next um, few hours or days, then please do email us with any further reflections that you have. Um, say, uh, Matt and I will be doing a kind of write-up of some of the key themes and questions that came through from today, and we'll be feeding that um, back to the community as well as, of course, um, through to the team leading the framework. Um, so thank you very much to Q, to Will, to Will, to all of you for putting in your comments and questions um, to be continued. Thanks. Absolutely. Thank you.